The 1950s satire, Player Piano, describes a dark dystopia where automation led to meagre consumption and a desperate idleness. Of course, this comes much after the real Luddite movement of the 19th century, where workers were seen destroying and sabotaging machines for fear of losing their job. Welcome to yet another episode of ABTV's Crossfire Debates, and today we will be discussing the future of work, keeping in mind automation and unemployment. Right now, today, about 50% of what we do across the board can be replaced by technologies that are in production right now. This is great, but my question is, what are people going to do then? I'd like to challenge the question around jobs, and we keep talking about jobs and the fear of losing a job. But I think we've got to just pause for a moment and consider that jobs is something that's only been around for the last you know, few decades or a couple of hundred years. That never existed before, and I don't believe they will exist in the future. Um, Welcome back to ABTV's Crossfire Debate. So here's a very cliched question for the audience. How many of you all think that automation is going to replace your jobs in the near future? Show of hands, please. Great, that's just one person. All right, in the studios right now, we have Ian Khan, futurist, and we have Mark Ackerman from ServiceNow. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for joining us. I think I'm going to start with a slide here. So one third of the United States workforce and between 400 and 800 million individuals globally could be out of a job by 2030 due to automation. So now uh, I'm going to ask you this, Mark. Do you think that the world or the way we're going is where there's going to be capital intensive work, where there's going to be more investment into robots and automation and not so much into remunerative work? Yeah, I think it's a bit of both. Uh, definitely there's going to be a lot of investment into the capital side of it. But in terms of automation, in terms of uh, technology and that, the people are going to have to get smarter. They're going to become a, str a stronger link within that. So where I'm coming from is I believe that the people are going to be uh, serviced by this automation. They're going to be serviced by technology and machine learning, and, and they're going to be able to be, become a stronger part of that link. Um, so it'll expose people that are not upping their game, essentially. Um, but I don't think it's going to be in replacement of that at all. Do you think there's going to be absolute automation at some point in the future where people are really going to be replaced? I think it's a matter of catching up. And uh, as far as the development of technology is concerned, right now, today, about 50% of what we do across the board can be replaced by technologies that are in production right now, which means 50% of all our jobs can be automated. But is it happening? No, it's not. It's a little bit more complex than that, how technology is being adopted, the transition of technologies in different industries. So the pace at which technology is evolving is fast. It's, uh, it's exponential, but at the rate of which it's being adopted is really, really slow. And that's the challenge that we're facing right now. So you're calling that a challenge, which means that you want to move towards a situation where there is absolute automation. So if you ask me, what would I rather do on an average day? I'd rather actually go to the beach and spend my entire day at the beach relaxing and maybe work for half an hour. Literally, that's what I want to do. And I think everybody else in the world should strive for a life where they can enjoy life more, do the things they like doing more. But what we end up doing is manual work that we call our job, our work. And I think we're just in this transitionary phase of understanding what we do as a purpose. And I think everything should be automated if it can. 45% of paid activities could be automated using currently demonstrated technologies. So off the top of my head, autonomous vehicles are going to replace Uber drivers, for instance. And then uh, waiters are probably going to be replaced in the near future. ATMs is a classic example from the past. And then 60% of occupations could have 30% or more of their processes automated. This is great. But my question is, what are people going to do then? Well, think about this for a, for a second. Um, you know, the, the automated teller machine, the ATM, where we get money from today, that was brought out in the early 70s. And at that time, you know, people were going around saying that people, the tellers will be replaced and, you know, they'll be they're left behind. But you fast forward now to where we are today. And in the U.S. alone, they went from 250,000 to 500,000 tellers still working in the banks. So did those people go away? Did the jobs go away because of the automation? No. The menial task, the automation within that has maybe gone away. But there's still that need for the relationship. Um, and I think a lot of people are starting to forget that we are still human. We have emotions. We'd work in different ways. Um, some people are 
less are more afraid of technology. They'll need more things explained. They'll need to have that emotional attachment. So what it has done in, in the banking industry, for example, is these big people have become relationship managers. Mm -hmm. They've become uh, salespeople. Yeah. So the whole role has evolved. But did the teller, as we know it, and as we would have been told in the 70s, gone away? No, it's actually doubled. So is that what's going to happen, Ian? That uh, people are going to be doing different jobs, probably not the same jobs, but just adapting their skills? You're right. And I think what is going to happen is our definition of a job should change and will change. And that's where I see a big problem. Uh, when you go to school, when you go into college, university, and you get training in a specific profession, there's a certain... Um, kind of a social uh, structure that you're expected to fit in. Uh, you'll get a job in a firm or you'll perform a specific task as a doctor, as an engineer, and that's kind of the path uh, that's traditionally being taught in the education system. And as a, a result of what's happening today because of technology is that that foundation is being shaken a little bit. And our definition of education has to change in order for us to be ready for the next 10, 15, 20, 30, 50 years. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's a focus here as well, is what's happening at the centennial, the 100 year anniversary of, of the country. So as we tackle the education part of it, our definition of professions and jobs will change. And it's no longer going to be about performing a task, but how do we create value? How do we uh, do things that, are, that, that have already been automated, but what can we do as people to use our senses that we have and machines don't have in order to create that value for communities, people, customers, and so on? And that's, I think, what our true um, calling is as human beings rather than perform a task that can be automated. But how do you put a price on it then? I think we have to evolve in our thinking as what do we get paid for? Uh, you can get paid to use your mind in many different ways, whether it's uh, using your uh, capabilities as a human uh, at an emotional level or, or to feel things. And these skills that cannot be built into machines, empathy uh, and other things and qualities that we cannot build into machines. Right, but then there clearly is a problem, right? I'll tell you what I'm getting at. 375 million workers, or roughly 14% of the global workforce, may need to switch occupational categories as digitization, automation, and advances in artificial intelligence basically rule the way we work. Uh, that is exactly what we discussed right now, and there's a huge shift happening there. But then we also need to talk about reskilling and upskilling and training, mentorship, education, and there is clearly a disparity in that. So there are a bunch of people who come with that particular background, the technical know-how, who've studied that in university, who have the experience. And then there's the other set who are just going to be removed from that aspect. So would they not feel disconnected from the labor market as they know it right now? I think it's we we got to be careful of brushing everything with the same stroke, and and we've got to look at different geographies, different places in economies, where different countries are in terms of uh, development as well, because not all countries will move as fast, not all areas will move as fast, and not all jobs will move as fast. You know, if we look back um, when we started moving away from farming and subsist subsistence, we really at that point in time there was very little education. There wasn't a job as we knew it; a nine to five didn't exist. So the people had to move out of that, and what the governments around the world did is they started bringing in education. So they, may, they raised, can you believe, the, the minimum age to leave school to 16, mm. you know, and, and people had to get educated. So they had to enhance their skills, but that didn't, take, uh, didn't happen overnight. So it's going to take time. Um, you know, a good example would be um, back in London, you would have had a job in the early 1900s being, uh, your title would be a knocker-upper. Mm -hmm. Now, a knocker-up at that time was waking people up. They were literally the alarm clock. They slept during the day and woke people up uh, in the mornings, in the early hours of the evening. That job doesn't exist today, and, and, and certainly they couldn't expect to be around. But did those people all go hungry and go without jobs? No, they probably started fixing alarm clocks and fixing watches, and so they would have evolved over time. It's, 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 the thing is, it's going to evolve quicker. And I think we've got to be alert to that and we've got to have the education programs and the awareness in there. And I think, importantly, people need to know that change is coming. It's, it's here. 
and we need to embrace it. But aren't we at this juncture way past those extremely menial jobs? We've already got a certain level of automation in the industry already, but we don't know what to expect from the future. And for that, again, coming back to training and education, that's not really happening because currently public spending on just labor training has gone down even the OECD countries. And these are the rich countries, just to put it plainly. And also corporate training budgets have been cut short, especially within this region. So how do you expect people to feel part of the economy? By the way, the economy is also slowing so how can they contribute to the economy essentially so two two questions right there in in what you just said first is education um, i really believe that if the the working class of today really wants to have this idea of a job tomorrow they have to unlearn a lot of things that they have traditionally learned in their careers through their education or behind you know back 10 20 20 years back this is an era of unlearning and relearning rapidly at, at a pace of urgency. We have to have a sense of urgency when it comes to acquiring new skills. Uh, digitization, artificial intelligence, um, whatever skills you think you do not have, you need to start acquiring them right now. Now, many I'm sorry, people... but this just goes against what you just said a little bit earlier, right, about people just working for, what, half an hour and being at the beach. So now yeah. you're putting the pressure of them learning yeah. and just uh, inculcating skills that they probably have no interest in. And secondly, they don't have the technical know-how for it. So in order for people to fit into this future that we're talking about, and yeah. we cannot foresee everything in the future, I really believe for them to use the skills that they will use in the so-called job of the future, they will have to have vast amount of knowledge in different areas. Many things that we're doing today uh, are old and redundant. So it's imperative that we learn about technologies that are shaping the world. We learn skills such as communication, empathy, and educate ourselves as much as we can, soak in everything that we can that will potentially get us ready for this era where you want to be on the beach and do nothing. For the first part of what you just explained, that doesn't look like it's going to happen in the near future. In the near future, what people have to do is learn and unlearn what we learned in the past and relearn all of these new skills. So it's going to be a rat race, which is why automation anxiety is coming back and it is surging. So 37% of workers are worried about losing their jobs directly because of automation. And that is the truth of the matter right now. So just to make sure that the people who are the most important and valuable assets, their mental health or just their, their uh, stress amounts are reduced right now. Do you think policies and governments need to do things and organizations need to come together and do things? One of the examples that we can think of off the top of our head is wage insurance. And that's not something that has been implemented on a blanket level at least, right? Yeah, I think I think the technology is coming irrespective, um, and I don't think that you can you can create policies and you know put put controls in place to slow it down. I think it's going to happen as a as a result of where we're going as a, as mankind. Um, I think the key thing is we've got to look back in history and look forward and go. We've always grown. There's always been a, a, an appetite to have more. You know, if there's never this 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 point, if you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we never get to the point where we have everything we want. So we're going to continue to grow and we're going to continue to need more things. And I think within that, then a lot of people, yes, may have the anxiety of losing their current job. But how many people stay in the same job their whole life? Um, and that job simply won't be there. So they need to start considering that there will be the change. Things are going to evolve. Um, it's difficult to say what that job will be in the future. It's almost like saying, you know, back in the, the 1900s, in the beginning, 40% was all related to farming. Mm -hmm. um, but today, only 2% of America, you know, 2% of the American population feed 310 million people. So where did all those people go? They didn't all go without jobs. But if you had taken a teleport and gone back in time and spoken to that farmer and said, look, um, you know, 40%, only 38%, if 38% will be gone and there will only be 2 million people feeding the whole country, what will the rest do? I don't think the farmer would have told you that there would have been yoga instructors and they would have been doing all kinds of different jobs lying at the beach and all that. They wouldn't yeah. have had a clue of what they're going to be doing. Obviously, it's a case by case, country by country cases, Correct. right? Yeah. So speaking of agriculture, where I am from, where in India, agriculture is a strong part of the economy and a lot of people are employed in that particular sector. Correct. It's not definitely not as less uh, as less as 2%. So then do you think there is going to be an economic disparity as a result of what we've been talking about in the 
the last 10 minutes or so. Automation and economic disparity, is that the truth? I have this stat again, which shows that uh, Slovakia is uh, twice as vulnerable to automation risks compared to Norway, for example. So now that is a problem, isn't it? I, I think there definitely is going to be disparity. That's the reality of it, because not everybody across the world is adopting to this huge technological change all at once at the same pace. It's not happening. Uh, different countries, different organizations are reacting at a different pace. And believe it or not, the gap between the rich and the poor, the successful and the ones that are struggling will increase. And for that reason, it's important that this 37% of people who have anxiety about their jobs and the future of work, they need to uh, channel this anxiety into a drive and a push to upskill what they're doing, to learn new things, and to be able to understand what the world of tomorrow will be driven with, how technology will take over, what parts of their jobs will be automated, how they can create a new career. And if they stop doing, if they don't think about these things, they, they, they will not have jobs in the future. Can I just ask you this then? How much are these new jobs going to pay? Is there, isn't there going to be not just job disparity, but also wage disparity in these new jobs? Rather, I'd, I'd have to ask you about the distribution of wages in these new jobs that you are talking about. You can come in first. I'd, I'd like to challenge the question around jobs. And we keep talking about jobs and the fear of losing a job. But I think we've got to pause for a moment and consider that jobs is something that's only been around for the last you know, a few decades or a couple of hundred years. That never existed before, and I don't believe they will exist in the future. Um, I think at the end of the day, we're going to become a lot more uh, task-oriented. We're going to become a lot more outcomes-based. So we're now going to be looking at things and saying, you know, if I am a doctor, at the moment I go to a hospital and I fulfill a, a provider service in that hospital. Tomorrow, I'm going to have technology in service of my skills. Okay, so it's not going to replace me, but now I'm going to be able to conduct a surgery on a child in India or in South Africa or in Canada at the same time, leveraging those skills. Um, so I won't be time-based. I won't be uh, kept nine to five in the office, but I'll be delivering these surgeries using technology throughout the world. So it'll become outcomes-based. So I think the concept of jobs is something as well that we're going to see that's going to start dwindling and it's going to become more of a task marketplace environment. Um, I I, I, I don't know. I'm, 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 I kind of don't agree uh, completely that we'll be task oriented, but there's definitely be going to be a huge difference between the work we do now and tomorrow. So we've been talking about uh, the changing nature of work and, and how we do it. Um, the future really is a little bit of an unknown. Twenty, if you fast forward twenty years from now, with the advent of you know autonomous cars taking over the roads, the logistics industry changing, truck drivers not driving trucks, uh, cars driving on their own, there's this entire unknown about the future that we all really should be looking forward to. Just like we didn't know 100 years ago what would happen uh, in 2019, uh, I really believe though there will be different ways to contribute to the to the to the ta term work um, there's strides such as uh, companies who are experimenting by uh, putting electrodes in the brain and using uh, that capability of ours to control things and do things. Maybe there will be a way to work without without doing anything so that we could just harness our mental computation capability just like you can use a computer right now in a data center, but just to use the computing capacity of our minds. So many things are still an unknown and we don't know what that future looks like. And perhaps make us even more lazy than we are right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because that is one question I've always had. So I was at an autonomous car conference recently and these were for personal vehicles. And my question was just, do we really need it? Do we really need to be that lazy? Why can't we just drive a car and go to a place? Why can't we have a human interaction at a McDonald's? Why do we have to go and type stuff in? So that whole human interactivity element and there's this whole process of de-evolution happening to us as human beings. So just that, do we really need that level of automation and that level of AI being implemented on a, on a blanket and mass scale? I think from a, if you look at a, a lot of people are looking at personal betterment and, and personal um, health and how they're getting better. And what we find from most times is we don't have time. The biggest excuse is I cannot exercise because I cannot, I don't have the time and so on and so forth. So if you start thinking about how you can release a, a lot of this time that we're keeping busy, um, you know, a, a, a study of work recently said we're spending 40% of our day just looking through emails, sifting through emails. Imagine if you could automate a lot of that and have something in service of that time to give that time back to you so you could spend that time 
doing some exercise, spending some time with the family. I think that in terms of embetterment of the health and happiness of the people would ultimately make them more productive. Mm -hmm. um, and we're starting to see this coming through now in terms of uh, the exercise just recently, uh, reports of Microsoft in Japan going down to a four-day work week and increasing productivity yeah. by 40%. 40% yeah, yeah so, so we're seeing this in the workplace and more work doesn't mean more productivity. Um, and I think giving back is really where we're going to see the, 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 the step change. Right. What do you think, Ian? Do we really need that level of automation, an absolute level of automation? L let me put a question back at you. A hundred years ago or 50 years ago, we would have had no idea that with the advent of smartphones, computers, technology, and all everything that we have access to today, how much efficiency we would have to right? We would we would think, hey, why do we need a computer to write something to somebody? Why would, do we need a computer to do our accounts? And it was just, we couldn't understand that probably 50 or 100 years ago. But today, these are essentials. These are necessary for us to be who we are and do the things we need to do. And you mentioned uh, lazy. Are we becoming lazy? I think there's many ways to, to do things and to still be busy to spend time on maybe thinking collectively as people, as humans, as intellectuals, on solving the world's biggest problems, poverty, climate change, environment, pollution. We need mental capabilities of people coming together and talking and discussing and how do we change things that are happening in the world rather than saying, okay, I'm going to go to work nine to five and by the end of the time, I'm going to be wiped out and I don't have time to think about the world because I'm too busy in my own life. At this juncture, especially in this region, I've just seen a lot of companies, big organizations, organizations throwing around words like digital transformation, AI, VR, XR, and just implementing it and investing heavily in it. But it's not objective driven. They're doing it because it's a fad. So do you think it has to be more objective driven than just fad driven just because everyone's doing it? Because people don't really know or get why it is being used or why it has to be used? Yeah, I think uh, what we're seeing is certainly that a lot of organizations are doing exactly that. They're saying we need to do digital transformation. We need to adopt IoT and AI and knowledge, uh, machine learning and so on without actually understanding what's the objective. Why are we doing that? And, you know, from what we, where we're sitting, we're saying we want to make the world of work work better for people. Um, and I was having a discussion this earlier today with someone saying that at the end of the day, organizations need to think about two personas, really. How do we make the world of work better for the employee? And how do we make it better for the customer? And when you start looking at these, these are outcomes based. And, and ultimately, when you start doing everything around digital transformation and automation, how do you make it easier for your employee to get what they need to do to get done easier in a day? Again, just talking about this region specifically, we are in a very comfortable place in terms of accessibility to inexpensive labor. So we do get um, cheap labor for especially blue collar workers from Nepal, Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, etc., where we have blue collar workers working for under 1000 dirhams. So from a business point of view, would I really want to automate or just invest so much in labor or in, in just machines where I can get the same job done for a lesser rate. A lot of the cheap labor, as we put it, or whatever it may be, it's at the end of the day, a lot of the automation is going to come where you want to guarantee quality in delivery. Um, and human beings don't deliver exactly the same quality every single time, all the time. And that's where machines and automation will lend itself to that. So I think where, you, where we start talking about the labor force, I think we'll start seeing that there'll be a transition where it's needed in order to deliver uh, uh, the same quality over and over and over again. That's where those areas are going to change faster. Um, but for the rest, I think um, the capitalist approach of does it make business sense to change it or not will still prevail for some time. All right, great. Unfortunately, we are running short on time, but we do have time for audience questions. So is there anyone with a question here? A uh, very interesting uh, conversation. My, you know, I, I think I was the only one who raised, uh, who, who raised my hand against the popular mandate. There's a reason for that. And I think it, it uh, lends itself largely into this very popular statistic that we often see in the uh, media today, roughly about a person to two of the entire world uh, controls about 60 or 80 percent of the total wealth in the uh, in the world. So to me, that itself is a telling story. Um, what also is uh, relevant to this uh, statistic is the fact that electoral mandates have been seeing dramatical uh, shifts. You we see, we never thought a Donald Trump is going to be in power. We at home, back home, closer home in India, saw a, a major shift in, uh, in, in the mandate that the people came up with. So to me, it's a reflection of what 
is happening. Um, I think largely we have uh, we have the workforce, you know, skilled, unskilled, who are putting out their voices there and are not happy with what the establishment is serving them. So I also take um, I, 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 I take uh, note of the fact that technologies did come in. Uh, the the same concerns were raised in the past, but then I think we haven't seen dramatic. Uh, you know differences but what i am uh, skeptical about going forward is that technologies as well have got extremely sophisticated so today uh, when for example i think um, you raised that point about drivers uh, come in, we have a large amount of drivers today who are going to be probably put out of jobs if automated cars are going to be seeing the road um, what's going to happen to all these people uh, these people are going to be more frustrated. We're probably going to see more law and order situations in the world. We're already dealing with enough. So how does one make sense of, you know, one, the statistic in terms of the total wealth, uh, the statistic in terms of the electoral uh, mandates changing, uh, and how does that kind of uh, buy into the fact that uh, you don't see this as a concern? Oh, let, let me let me answer that. So, from from the changing perspective of jobs and drivers, this is a really great question. Yes, taxi drivers and, and and truck drivers will start losing their jobs, but it's not going to happen overnight. You're probably going to see a shift in maybe the next a couple of decades, maybe fifteen to twenty years, where there will be a mass, uh, you know, technology will take over. So we have this time frame for all of these people to start thinking about everything else that they can do. It's a great time for entrepreneurship. Uh, the startup economies are growing. There's so many different opportunities to, to create um, or to work uh, in, with, with upskilling your, your skills and, and learning more uh, to do something else. So we have all this time to start thinking about what other careers can you have. Uh, so we need to open up our minds a little bit and say, well, what else will happen? So education is very important in every industry that we make people aware of what the challenges are in the next two, five, 10 to 20 years, but then also what opportunities exist to, to do 10 different things that are better or more exciting or that fit them uh, what they could be doing. So I think that's what we need to do right away is start educating people, countries, economies, countries, everybody uh, as soon as we can. So I know we talk about free and fair education, but then just going back to his point, there's no equal distribution of wealth. There's no equal distribution of resources either. So then when you're talking about one particular segment of the society who are going to be affected, so maybe the richer countries and the people from that segment won't be affected. And even the lower income might not be as affected, but this middle sector, they're the ones who are always sandwiched, isn't it? So what are these people going to do considering there's this disparity? Yeah, look, there's, there's a lot of discussion out there. There's a lot of protagonists for the the wealth disparity and, and, and the guys already start talking about, Mark Cuban is talking about the trillionaires that yeah. will be created out of this technology. And, and yes, this is true and there will be a greater disparity. But you also got to consider if you look at China, for example, um, over 100 years ago, they had 780 million people that were in extreme poverty. And today they only have about 10 million people in extreme poverty. And, and we've already gone, we've already evolved with technology to where we are today and will continue to evolve. So yes, there may be a greater disparity of the haves and the have nots but the have-nots are less and less and less to the point where globally there's estimates um, that are talking about 53% of people that are above you know, middle class or in the middle class space, um, leaving a much smaller proportion of people that are living in either extreme poverty or in poverty. Mm -hmm. So as a whole, yes, the nation and the worlds around us have become better, um, but there will still be more people and, and more control. So back to your point, you know, 1% controlling probably 53 or more percent of the global uh, economies is, is a big disparity, but everybody is moving. So yeah, like they say, a rising tide raises all the boats. And I think that's really what we're going to be seeing. All right, great. So now I'm going to come back to the audience poll. How many of you all think after the 20, 30 minute discussion we've had that automation is going to take away your jobs? Show of hands, please. We've seen two. Three hands go up now. <laughs> All right, great. Thanks so much for coming in. Thank you for joining us here and thanks for those valuable insights. And thank you for watching ABTV's Crossfire Debate. 
Thanks for watching ABTV's Crossfire Debate. Today was our final episode of this season, but we will be back again with the next season very soon. Until then, watch this space as we have tons of new and exciting shows coming up for you. So don't forget to hit that subscribe button and of course, like, follow and share this video. To the computer camp for adults, this is Abhishek. We're coming live from this beautiful studio right here from Cloudfest 2018. And with me in this studio is a very special gentleman. Of course, we do business daily, but we also need oversight. And this is what he specializes in. It's technology futurist. That's the name that he goes by. And we have Ian Khan in the studio. So uh, tell me more. Uh, first of all, you're here at Cloudfest. How's the feeling? Well, thanks for having me, Abhishek. I think Cloudfest is uh, the mm -hmm. place to go to, and I said this in my videos that were pre-event, mm -hmm. that if you want to be part of change, if you want to be part of industry, and cutting edge is an overused word, but I will still say it, cutting edge technology, you've got to be at Cloudfest. Uh, this is Europe's largest cloud event. Uh, it, it's got everybody from hosting to infrastructure to hardware in here. Yes. And since morning, it's been crazy, crazy busy since morning. Sessions have been good. Uh, conversations have been good. So I think this is the place to be. Yeah. And thank you so much for having me. It's actually not only Europe's, it's the world's largest gathering because you won't believe this. We have 2,500 companies working in one sphere and that's that amazing. is domain and hosting and yep. the other is allied services. That's so amazing. this makes it the biggest one. Uh, what kind of conversations you've been having with people here? What's your general experience, your, your general experience? So my general experience, I, what I do at events, I ask a lot of questions. I okay. want to know from people what is driving them to be here or at mm -hmm. any event. What is, is it sales and, yes, of course, sales and meeting people mm -hmm. are the two things that everybody wants. Who would come to an event and say, no, I don't want to meet anybody. But for me, it's more than that. I ask them, what, what are some of the challenges your business is facing. How do you anticipate to change that here? Who are you looking forward to meet to? So this really helps me understand the mindset of the people and it helps me in my research. This is yeah. what I write about. This is what gives me the fuel that I write about in my books. And so those are some of the conversations that have been happening. Uh, last night we had a, a huge party, the Connections Party. It was a great opportunity to meet so many different people. Mm -hmm. But I think overall the theme that is emerging for me is that everybody is looking to go above and beyond what they do on an everyday, everyday basis, basis at work. Uh, every day they're busy with their core functions, but here they are in a different environment. Yeah. Well, you're in Europa Park, so it's a different environment altogether, but then you meet your peers, your competition, and you're side by side with your competition, but it's not about competing with them here. It's about creating and channeling the industry towards a common objective, and that's what I like. Yeah, that, and that common objective being growth. Now, coming towards growth, uh, the key word, uh, we also have that data is growing at a phenomenal you know, rate and uh, uh, I think I read it on your website itself. You know, We only use 2% of the data that we are generating. What does this mean for us? Uh, first of all, from the perspective of uh, companies handling this data and are we, how, what are you going to do with this? Could you just share some insight on this please? Absolutely. So I, I'm going to take you back in time a few uh, hundred thousand years ago when man first discovered fire. So you can imagine when man first discovered fire, they, they started cooking a little bit food on it and it was like, okay, let's do a little bit of grills, let's do a bit of skewers. But then mm -hmm. fast forward thousands of years ago, thousands of years in, in, in the future, we have a hundred billion uses of fire. We do so many things with fire. We take it for granted We right take now. it for granted yeah, like that we have uh, something yeah, called fire. Yeah, okay? yeah, something called fire. Similarly, I feel that in time, in technological terms, we are at that point of infancy where we've still, you know, where we've just started generating this data. We're overwhelmed with big data and how much data is being generated by social media, by all other means. But I think we're using a, such a small fraction of it that it's not even being used to the extent that it can be used. Going into the future, maybe 15, 20, 50 years from now, when we have more capabilities of using this data, we have AI, uh, as an example, developed yeah. to such an extent that it can analyze data and do much more with that, maybe your, your mortgage, your credit, will be given to you based on the big data that you generated yeah. throughout your, your life. life throughout your life and that's your marker every person's identity will be their big data, data and not everything else so I think we're still in the stage of infancy mm -hmm. and data has a tremendous amount of impact we're seeing a little bit of that right now in healthcare in autonomous cars and these all of these things are about collection of data and how we use that data connected cars automated cars are all about the data it's mm -hmm. all about the data so uh, 
but you know conceptually looking at this do, do you think we are we at a stage not only at discovering the fire stage but let's light a fire everywhere because we also have companies that are let's generate data let's generate data but there's also got to be a concept or a conceptually right way of generating data and just not having data would you throw some insights from that please because I don't want everything to know. I, like, for example, if I want to know more about you, but I, I don't need all the data. It's what I need. So that's I'm just speaking data useful yep. and versus data generation or collection. Yep. So, so I, do you, you want to know more about the use of data or the generation part? Uh, yeah, the generation part. Generation because we're part. right at that stage yeah. where we're discussing all this. I, I, uh, I think we're, we're just discovering our ability to generate data. Companies hmm. today are just discovering this phase where now they can have a lot of customer data, uh, environment data, production data, uh, what have you data, any kind of data. In healthcare, it's your, uh, it's a marker for everything your, your patients are doing. So I think we're just at that initial stage where we're just getting mm -hmm. so excited with the fact that we can generate now data. a lot of data. We've got a lot of information. It's like a feeding frenzy of sharks. You know? It is. Let's just go. But as you know, we're still not there in terms of analyzing this data. We talk about artificial intelligence a lot and it's going to do all mm -hmm. good things. But we're not at a stage where you can just put all this data into a system that can be and efficiently built, that's efficiently priced, that's low priced because barrier to entry is also a big challenge. It's a big so challenge. You, you don't have this ability to plug in this data to somewhere and there you have all the results. Accessibility to computing is also a, a, a challenge. This Absolutely. That's what you're getting down to. Absolutely. Okay, uh, uh, now we find that, uh, of course, first came the internet, then came social networks and, and all of this. The, the next technology that's going to impact everybody is going to be IoT. Because right from a fridge to a fan to everything that we use is going to be interconnected. Uh, this is also going to generate user data, but along with this comes challenges too. So like privacy, uh, getting hacked because th there was uh, uh, something that I read about a car where they used the Bluetooth to hack into the car's uh, main console, you know, the, the computer console. Mm -hmm. So could you share some insights about IoT? Just a brief about what's going to be happening next, where are we on with that, and the challenges that IoT also brings. So great question. The bigger, some of the things that are, the bigger things that are coming up for the Internet of Things are in the area of connected cities or smart cities, smart cities, where your infrastructure is connected. And it's not just connected because we like it being connected and we like playing on our apps. It's because it, it creates a lot of value for cities that are managing those cities in order of efficiency to optimize uh, the you know, yeah. operations within that city. So for cities in general, it's a, it's a highly efficient way of making sure that things run smoothly for citizens of those cities, countries, places, towns, it's imp it gives them functionality over things that they wouldn't previously have. For example, your building might be uh, internet IoT monitored. It's a smart building. Your, your, your apartment knows when you're entering the home. It'll switch on the mm -hmm. lights. Those are just consumer side of things. But from a building manager's point of view, the efficiency is tremendous. Yes. So that's one side of it. When you talk about connected cars, connected infrastructure, connected transportation, it's going to change the way we work. It's going to create a tremendous amount of efficiency in the logistics industry as yeah, such. Logistically, uh, yes. I do a lot of work in the Middle East, and if you look at countries such as Dubai, Dubai. as an example, cities of city uh, like Dubai, they're investing heavily in infrastructure, automation, automation and smart, and so on. Barcelona is such a great example of the Internet of Things enabled in a city okay. where they've been able to save millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars in costs that they were incurring in the past to okay. just manage the city, to manage uh, garbage collection routes as an example. Okay. But now garbage cans are Internet smart. of Things enabled, they're smart, they can tell you when they're g becoming they full, full, and then you can send your pickup trucks automatically mm -hmm. and they'll pick up that. So that efficiency in routing those garbage routing trucks the garbage truck. is savings in fuel, savings in time, cost, effort, and so on and so forth. Uh, so that's to That's what the things. world is going to be. This is to. where we're going. This is where we're headed. I mean, the smartphone that we look at today and, you know, we can perhaps switch off and on a light, that's just the least amount of IoT. Uh, uh, that's just for the consumer basic home level. Correct. But we, we are talking about it from the government perspective or a bit as, as, a, as you said, the, the guy managing the building. Correct. So we're talking from that perspective. Correct. Uh, but also now with this comes challenges, you know, like one, for example, is like I'm a normal day user. So I get very afraid if I'm... Uh, going to be using equipment that is on the net. I don't know if someone's going to be monitoring me or could do something wrong with my system. 
or play around with me in, 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 the, in the good way that I'm just using very simple terms to say the challenges that it poses to me. So can you throw some insights on this that we are having technology that's going to enable us to do great things. But along with that comes the challenges. Can you Absolutely. share some insight so on this? Everything has challenges in life. I mean, if you look at our traditional world right now, forget about mm -hmm. IT and we have technology around us. Anything that exists, your house, your car, your, your, um, your business, everything has locks on it right now. Anybody can pick that lock, steal your files, uh, steal, steal your, your equipment. I mean, wh why are we surprised that technology, and I, and I don't like it when technology is being made the bad guy. Uh, if you look at CloudFest right now, downstairs, there's hundreds of companies who specialize in security. They are pushing the boundaries of making sure that, hey, we've got the best firewall, we've got the best capabilities. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the real reality of the situation, that as technology becomes more complex, it becomes more complex to create security solutions that say, okay, 100% security, but there's still a chance that somebody might hack into it because the bad guys are working equally faster, faster. and harder to so find different ways, ways to get in, ways to hack in. So there will always be hacking, there will always be security challenges, but the fact of the matter remains that we've got to find a way to, to have a different relationship with our environment. So for example, the newer technologies that uh, protect your money as an example blockchain. Uh, is not a traditional bank anymore it's, it's right so it's it's blockchain powered let's say it's bitcoin or cryptocurrencies. cryptocurrencies they have a completely different mechanism of being secure but then they're still not secure, secure. right they're still not secure there's an example of a cryptocurrency that just launched and they're looking for an actual physical bank vault to store all the codes because, because they, they don't trust the network anymore. Network so anymore. that was such a funny story that I read a few days ago. <laughs> and that's digital, but yet staying analog. We are in a constant <laughs> paradigm of change, and this will continue to happen. I don't think that should stop us from adopting to technology, technology. because the, the, there's many more good points than the bad points. There will always mm -hmm. be hackers, but then the way we deal with information is different. The way we store information is different. So mm -hmm. we'll see what the future brings. Future and. Uh, Coming here at CloudFest, now this is, as you said, cutting edge, right? It's because everybody's here and it's about taking the industry forward. What are your key takeaways for, for, for the whole uh, industry out here? Where, where, what are the challenges you think they will be facing in the coming days? I think the biggest challenge that anybody faces, whether it's people downstairs, their customers, their partners, the or the industry worldwide, the challenge is not creating something faster, bigger, uh, more expensive, or, or something that does more. The challenge is more working with people and how to propagate that change that we together can create. Yeah. The biggest challenge literally downstairs is not whose technology is the fastest, but it's about who can I connect with so that we can together Solve work on it. a solution that helps people out there. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people are very financially driven, which is great. So you need revenue to come into your company, you need to make those numbers. But I really believe that, that the financial side of things, the revenue side of things is a side effect of creating value. The more value you create for yeah. a community or customers or the world, the more revenue you will automatically generate. So it really depends on where your company is focused and what you do. I teach the seven actions of value creation and mm -hmm. none of them are about technology. They're not about let's create the fastest technology. They're mm -hmm. more about let's figure out the nuts and bolts of how we can create change and how do we translate that into treating people better, into growing our organizations from inside out rather than just putting a band-aid solution and just moving forward. So I think, uh, to answer your question, the, the challenge is, is not technology. technology. The te technology is an opportunity to move forward. The challenge is to work with people okay. and how t can we find a way to, to shake hands with other people, even if it's your competition, okay. to, to move forward and create value for the world out there. So it's, it's, it's more about the value between people that's more important. Uh, now I'm going to put a trick a question to you. Go for it. Where does Mr. Khan stand on the doomsday prophecy of AI? The self-aware AI versus AI serving humanity. Where do you stand on this? I think I There's am. There's a big uh, debate going on. So absolutely. I just I'll get this out from you. I, I think I'm excited as well as afraid. Right. And uh, you know, there is. Uh, why is that? Give us both. Why is what's the excitement? I'm for? I'm excited because uh, that that self-aware AI can solve a lot of problems. I mean, we've got 2.5 
billion plus people in the world today that do not have access to basic health care. They can't go to a doctor and get a tablet and feel better. And there's a million plus people without fresh water. There's just so many challenges of the world with war, famines, so on and so on and so mm -hmm. forth. And we have been unable to solve, solve those them. problems. We're, we're doing nothing about them even though we want to, but we can't. So I'm hoping that self-aware AI is able to come up with solutions that we don't have right now. Right now and plus enhance the quality of our lives right. and our children and the future and make the world a better place. Not uh, fair. The, the negative point is that I'm afraid that if that AI becomes uh, evil and that's... Self-aware and that's, saying things, yeah. humanity itself is the problem. Right. The way we see it in the movies. Exactly. That and uh, that would be a, a, a phase where we are not yet. I believe we are maybe 15, 20 plus years from that point. Mm -hmm. and we will know by then yeah. where we are at. I'm hoping that during this time, during right now to the next 20 years, we would have learned by designing those systems System. that what are some of the challenges we're facing with it and we can build uh, those kind of, um, you know, the safety points uh, to, do, to work with it. I'm not saying we can just switch it all off, but to work with it and how can we move forward. I don't know yet, we'll see. So can I sum it up as thread down this path, but with Caution. With caution. Proceed yeah. with caution. Proceed with caution. Yeah. <laughs> okay. One last question sure. uh, before we come to an end uh, to this session. One word that defines CloudFest for you? I would say it's change. Change? Change for the good. Change to make things better. Mm -hmm. And uh, change towards uh, the positive side. Okay. So the key word from him is uh, change for us here at CloudFest. It resonates with C. C is for CloudFest. Yep. C is for change. And uh, thank you, Mr. Khan, for being here in the studio. You're very welcome, Abhishek. Thank it's you so pleasure. much for having me. And uh, all of you watching this, keep tuning back in. I'll keep getting you scoops like this from backstage, from what's happening here. And of course, please keep uh, using a hashtag. It's CloudFest. And with this, I'll see you back again. And I'll get you some more good news. With that, bye-bye. Uh, Ciao. See you.